Professor Kaplan check off, so please do so now. Okay, thank you very much. It seems that in your talk, you tend to uh, separate the views of Mujerati from the views of the people. And I wonder if that view is actually affected by a sort of you know, history and philosophy that is um, emerging from the 1970s or the 19th, well, from the 18th century or the 19th century. I mean, to me, it seems like um, the Confucian scholars or Literati might not have that consciousness to separate themselves from from the people. I mean, it's it's very um, it's very um, to me it's a very normal idea to just focus on one group of that society. I mean, it's, to me, it's more like a whole. So I want to hear your opinion. Mm. I'm not sure I thought that. Um, okay, so. Chinese literati, some of them do. The ones that we use in order to understand China, it's a very small part of the literati, of course, they tend to talk about local religious culture as su, in su the su, so just customs, or you, stupid, right? I mean, and so on. So they tend to be very derogatory from the near Confucians onwards. Uh, then, the lead officials, often of a Wu background, uh, have a tradition of uh, persecuting, or at least prohibiting local religious culture, temples. Not just shamanic or medium temples, but all forms of local religious culture. So, in that sense, although not sociologically I would say they actually are very much part of local religious life, they do set themselves apart in practice, and they want to be different. I think they are very similar in many ways. I see a lot of things happen in Confucian religious culture, the religious culture of Literati that actually is sometimes Buddhist or or Taoist or just local. But they would deny it and they would then persecute. Uh, one of the famous examples would be the Wutu, the five penetrations cult of Suzhou region which is prohibited by a prominent adherent of early Qing, well, let's say, orthodox Confucianism, Wu. Um, if we would interview him, he would, I don't know, I mean, it's, I'm now really speculating, I think, huh? but if we would interview him, he would probably deny having a religion that's similar to the people he's persecuted. So I think there are the, cinema, the, sim, the similarities, and there is also an attempt of this, this part of the elite to separate themselves from it. It may not be true, but they want to. And the thing is, they may be a very small, representative part of the literati class, I would argue, but they are very vociferous and very dominant in terms of the text they produce part. Most of the texts that we have are produced by people with a certain anti-local religious point of view. So on that level, I think I, I would stick to my distinction. But lar by and large, and, and that's why these mysteries, if they're not there, but these mysteries, uh, Atkins and so on, are so interesting because they also talk to literati and they actually very explicitly say that although on the one hand the literati, local literati, so not the highest, but the more local literati will say, oh, all this local religious culture we don't do. And then they stress, in reality, their wives, their younger brothers, yeah, the rest of the family will still practice it. It's a bit like today, in communities with a strong today today, literally, not yesterday. Um, to, to communities with strong religious life in the sense of uh, temple culture, for instance, or Christian culture, and yeah, like Windrow, local officials, which means communist party members, will come to religious activities, because if they don't, they can't become part of the local community. So if religious culture is strong enough, these party cadres will come, and some of them actually are probably hidden, Christians or Buddhists or whatever. So on the one hand, they will claim there's a separation of the party and the rest, but in practice, it's much more fluid. And I think in the past, in China, it was very similar. But in terms of, in terms of talking about religious culture, there are these literati who claim that theirs is different. And it's important for us not to be influenced too much by them. And that's why I make these points. Yeah? Um, 
Um, thank you for your talk. And I came from an anthropology background, so obviously I'm very emphasized on that, uh, research based on lived experiences, a certain society or region. And um, I'm just wondering how do you think the anthropological studies or ethnographies about um, Chinese popular religion or Chinese societies, customs, how does that kind of um, intellectual work fit into the intellectual traditions of studying Confucianism in Chinese studies? This kind of maybe there is a discipline called Chinese studies, but I felt that there was not much dialogue between the anthropologists studying studying China today and the historians or ethnologists. Mm -hmm. so, well, you're right. Well, first of all, there is only one book that I know of that is sort of as quality of something you might call Confucianism, which is uh, by Jing. Oh, sorry, forgotten. He is in one of the Beijing universities, but I forgot his name. Jing Jin. Jin Jin. Jin Jin. Could be. Anyhow, he, he published a book in English. On a family, the Kung families. Yeah, yeah. Chang was a memory. That's it, right. Yeah. So we're talking about the same person. So he, in that sense, if that's Confucianism, then he would be field work into it. What, what you could do is field work. Okay, so doing field work by Chinese of this phenomena or what remains of it, which is very limited, would be very tricky because almost by definition, anthropology tends to deconstruct. Uh, traditions and will probably discover that what we think is fusion today is not, right? It's yeah. made up and so on. So I think that kind of fieldwork is not likely to happen. Um, but what could have been done, maybe it's too late now, is fieldwork, for instance, in Seoul, Korea. Because in Seoul, Korea, you have a living, a living Confucian tradition, and they have a Confucian temple next to uh, one of their universities. It's a living ritual tradition that goes back a number of centuries and so on. You could do field work there. You want to react? Yeah, I want. Yeah, um, I want to add that I don't think there is such a distinction between the Confucianism, whether you see it as still a authentic um, kind of Confucianism lived in. Korea, or when you see it as authentic and it's not really remains authentic in China at large. Um, but in addition to Jinjin's study, there's, there have been a lot of Western anthropologists already studying um, China in Taiwan, Hong Kong, or in Inner China. And nowadays, and from 19... Um, no, 19, 1950s or 60s already, there are Western from UK or US, they, they have come to China and doing field work there. Mm -hmm. But it seems that there, um, it seems that you come to the conclusion that there is a contradiction between um, the sinologists who uh, study China um, through the text so that it can avoid their Orientalist kind of um, perspective on on their study, and um, and uh, which is opposed to the those who uh, those sinologists who are, who have lived in China, talked to Chinese people, say so they might wear those kind of um, prejudice um, lens as a missionary or. or as a Western scholar. Um, but do you think there is a contradiction between them? Because for a Western anthropologist, they might not say they wear an Orientalist view and live in China instead. Well, we can never escape our own backgrounds. So I'm sure I look at, I know for sure, I look at China in a Dutch way. If you want, yeah. after I can point out how I do, but a number of my topics that I study have been influenced by my own background and I sometimes make it explicit in prefaces and so on. So we always have our background, that, yeah, our baggage that we take in. Um, but, but with religion, 
religious studies of China would be one of the few fields where actually the people who do texts and the people who do fieldwork meet. Uh, an example in point, a case in point would be the guy uh, back called Schipper Schipper, because he was most Dutch guy, but most active in France, in Paris. He is the one who literally rediscovered Taoism. So he was trained texts in texts in the 1950s and early 1960s, completely textual. And most of his career remained text-based. But the reason he could discover or rediscover Taoism, he tells so himself is fairly reliable, not everything, but this part is reliable, is when he was in the Ecole d'Extemoyal in Taipei, right? He's sent by the Ecole d'Extemoyal, so of the Far East, right? The French school for studies of the Far East, to go to Taipei to basically prove his Chinese and uh, study with uh, Tai Da scholars, couldn't go to the mainland in those days, we were speaking early 1960s. He walked around, and the way he told it to me is that uh, you had this group of scholars, Chinese scholars, I mean, not Taiwanese, still mainland scholars on Taiwan, studying Quinchu, Quinchu right? I mean, very written stuff in those days on Taiwan, because it was that never lived on Taiwan. It's, uh, Thing. They were studying Quinchu, and they were not aware of the fact that around, literally around the corner in a temple, they were performing Katsushi, Katsushi, right? local Taiwanese theater. They were completely divorced from living practice. So he went there, and then he went to a Taoist temple, and he saw a Taoist priest performing Taoist rituals. Probably, right? that's how I always do it. You walk around, and you ignore. I mean, you are not part of the ritual, so you can do what you want as long as you are polite, you come in and look at the texts, right? You, those days you didn't have fancy cameras, so you had to look at the text, and he saw this text and recognized it. And he he thought, said to himself that these are texts I have studied, but I have, I have, skipper, have studied them as 5th, 6th century texts. And this is Taiwan, 1962 or 1963. So you have this, uh, you have this guy, yeah, who literally, yeah, well, it's not that field work, but he makes a crucial observation in the field. And from there, he starts to study living Taoist practice and a number of other. It's extremely common among textual scholars of Taoism, unlike Buddhism, actually, but, but uh, among textual scholars of Taoism to study living Taoist religion. So actually, that part of the field is very common. To interact with Buddhism is much less so. And the Buddhist, they, the people who do Buddhism don't usually live in Chinese Buddhist monasteries, but in Japanese or I mean, there is a different connection. But you have had this, this field work and text work that is combined. Uh, I don't think you ask a question. Are you thinking about Buddhism where um, often the person was thinking? Or are you thinking of a risk of um, people who study uh, kind of live, uh, so going to interact with people um, and seeing what that's really in practice? Are you thinking that those are the people risk of going naked and that will kind of lose sight of that objective distance that would allow them um, to study the phenomenon in a more objective way or, well, as opposed to books that you have a book and then you can think oh, you know, you can understand back a little bit and can say oh actually um, I'm being a bit too biased uh, now or I'm being a bit too um, um, I don't know um, by the gas, by the, I don't know if you're thinking of that. Yeah. Oh, no. Sorry, it just is a question about the paper. Yeah, my question is, I think it's exactly opposite. I think it's, it's um, if you're only studying the text, it's, the text has been, um, because I'm not a fanalist or I'm doing text studies. So my focus always think that to get some lived experiences with the, with the traditions or customs before studying is, um, is important supplementary to text studies. You cannot just confine mm -hmm. um, with what the text has conveyed to you. Um, and I'm just wondering how does those um, text-based studies can go together with the studies of the lived 
experiences because I sought this work to kind of groups of people were doing. Well, okay, so in, in, in Chinese, in the field that I know best, or the, let's say, religious history, social history of religion, or contemporary religious culture, there is a very strong interaction between people who do field work and people who study textual, not in Buddhism, but the other, all other aspects of Chinese religious culture is a very strong interaction. So, a, a guy like, well, even I did field work, uh, but, but I study in persecuted religious groups, so if I do field work there, they are discovered by the police. Or, uh, the police won't let me go. So I can't do field work among them. That's dangerous. Yeah? But I can study all kinds of other things in order to understand better the way their rituals work and so on and so forth. So even I, although I'm mostly textual, have come into the field to understand more about living religious practice. Uh, on, for instance, the question that interests me that you can't get from text is do people actually understand what they are doing? A very constant question. Mm -hmm. Do they understand why, what, how? And obviously they don't. Well, they don't. Or rather they think about it in another way. And then I did a bit of field work to understand how do Chinese people who practice very complicated rituals engage with the meaning or the textual contents yeah, of these texts, so, which you can only find out through field work. Yeah, because they didn't write it down in a way that's accessible to us. So I did that, um, and I know people like Han Bao, you know, Paul Katz, uh, where about all people who did a lot of textual work on religious culture, like they do field work, this very moment, well not maybe literally, but these days, they do field work both in Taiwan, uh, colleagues have done a lot of field work in Jiangxi, in Hakka territory, they have done a lot of field work, obviously, in, uh, they are not doing a lot of it now in Hunan, it's a Harvard professor who has made his career on the basis of a book on Tang Buddhism. So he's an exception. And now he's doing field work in Runa. So actually, the, in the lit studies, it's quite common. Social history is extremely uncommon. Uh, and the other way around, too, anthropologists usually are, uh, let me limit, uh, anthropologists of China usually are very bad historians, generally, but because they have not learned to distrust texts. But, but, yeah, so anthropologists usually can't even read Western anthropologists, can't even read Chinese very well, and they're not trained linguistically properly. Mm. And they certainly cannot read classical Chinese, which means if it's religious work, yeah, if you can't read classical Chinese, you can't really study Chinese religious culture. So there is, there is that problem. So people, then there is a guy like Maurice Friedman, yeah, a former Oxford uh, Professor of uh, at all sorts, I think, of, of Chinese anthropology. He basically didn't know Chinese. He's brilliant. He yeah, has produced extremely important work in the 1960s, 1970s, but essentially, maybe originally could do some Cantonese, but no field work, no Chinese. Mm -hmm. And yet, his work is very important, so it's so complicated. But in the field of religious studies, there's always been a lot of interaction outside of the Buddhist field. In the Buddhist studies, people usually go to Japan and are strongly influenced by the Japanese way of looking at Buddhism, so that is a distortion. In history, you will have, you have tens of Westerners, and mostly Americans, who do Qing history, and they will never ever write or read about Qing religious life. They just want, and same for me, <laughs> very similar limitation. It, then, they are very separate fields, but that's another problem in anthropology and uh, religious studies, the problem is more that religious studies is a field, history is a field, literature is a field, and so on. But that's not the question. So, so my hands. Now I wanted to say that um, if we wonder what really is what we call Confucianism, we can get very interesting answers from Chinese themselves for the age through what we call the syncretic Chinese literature, because they have to defend, you know, in the literature of the Sandhya. There are numerous treatises and they defend their respective position, they give their own argumentation, and we find many answers, you know. But and the thing is, they wouldn't call it Confucianism, right? Sorry? They would not call it Confucianism. Um, no, in Tibet, in 18th century, 
because they studied all this and uh, of course they were um, using the Chinese influence literature and uh, they give the higher place to Buddhism uh, but they, they call uh, Confucianism the way of the scholars okay. uh, Confucian learning we give in, in, in English but it's the way of the scholars and uh, the, the Tibetan manage to identify many um, Confucianist points to make them similar to Buddhism. But of course, they assimilate Taoism, it was more dangerous, they say, to, to burn the pre-Buddhist religion in Tibet. So, but there are a huge Chinese literature this kind of, we have many important argumentation. <coughs> the first, the Ming Emperor himself wrote Sun uh, uh, Lun. there are many, many like this, and there are many different argument argumentation, and it's very interesting to give a right answer. Mm -hmm. I would, that's all correct. Mm -hmm. I, I would just not call it Confucianism in order not to Confucianism we created as well, you know, so... Well, uh, but, but to them it's not Confucianism, it would be the religion of the scholars, right? To the Tibetans that you just uh, talked about. So I would, really first want way, to know, yeah. I would first want to know myself, what did they see as the religion <coughs> of the scholars? What did they include and exclude? And then, maybe for political reasons it might be expedient to call it Confucianism because I could then get money for it, but... I would rather first leave this word Confucianism out because it suggests that everything we call Confucianism is somehow connected. And rather uh, see what they thought was this, this uh, way of the scholars, right? Like Bun. Well, Bun may be constructed as the pre Buddhist religion, but it obviously isn't. It's full of Buddhism. So whatever it is, it's no longer the Christian pre- That's what we argue uh, now, of course. The the but it is something that very is... Very fashionable nowadays. So mm. They want to say there, where the original and there didn't borrow anything. That's not true. <laughs> of course, each, bor each side borrows and assimilates things from the other side. And they appropriate, of course. So, so my point is, I'm not interested in what is the original Confucianism mm. is kind of more in what people, how they construct what they include. Mm. And what is useful for me, and not you, but for me, in looking at what these 19th century people did is that they are living in China, they are observing, and to them, eh, this is a living religious culture. So, since this is a dimension of Confucianism, or of 20th century thinking, on the basis of ideas described to Confucius that's now lost, I want to get that dimension back yeah, and see, say, okay, when we look at 2,000 years of history of interacting with texts that are somehow ascribed to Confucius, the classics, the Lumen, and so on, when we do that, we have to take serious the fact that they burned incense for these texts, that they worshipped Confucius, that actually the worship of Confucius and rituals well, it was a very important part of what they did. What they did was not trying to figure out what the documents meant for the poets, the, the oaths and so on, but was actually to recite these texts in things that would now be called religious activities. They would burn incense, they would uh, sacrifice to Confucius and so on. So that's what the only work that my paper in the end has. Right? It's showing that these 19th century people saw that, yeah, that these texts are not dead texts that they were part of a living religious culture, whereas the 20th century uh, authors who claim to discover the original Confucianism leave something very important out, which is the religious context. So that's, and the word, and I do that by showing that the word Confucius, Confucianism, and what it supposedly means has, is a very recent invention, therefore it frees us to yeah, leave that word behind and maybe have more attention to the very different ways of constructing the import of the words of Confucius or the words described by Confucius in the past. So your scholars are and so on and so on.
So I agree, there is a lot to be learned, but I just wouldn't call it information on Confucianism. That's all. I think also you know the French, yeah, we were not there were some uh, uh, fathers that uh, couvreurs who translated everything into French and into Latin, you know. And uh, Chaban, yes, this Pelio, they don't, they didn't live alone, but they had huge team of translators, and it's like nowadays in the same house. They, have, they find, they try to find the most interesting, great uh, Chinese scholars, you know, who help them, and they have, they learn, I guess, also. And many of uh, the French uh, missionaries in China, yes, some, they didn't know much, but some, like these people, were extremely scholars, they, they learned a lot. Even if we know the position of the Jesuits, you know, but nowadays in Taipei, uh, the Institute Richie, well, Taipei all the time, they wrote dictionaries, and they taught the Chinese, the Chinese, Chinese universities, you know, they, they are not detached, no, not at all. Sorry, I'm French. 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 French friends. So it's true that before there was this huge separation between philology and anthropology. And I must say, I, I, I would agree for the balance between the two. Nowadays what is happening, anthropology gets all the funding, all... So but I'm not talking about the present, right? I'm talking about the 19th century, so... Yes. So, now they learn the language, they live there. Mm -hmm. but the work produced by the former philologist, which was unique and great, and it's not the same level. I must admit, it is different. Yeah, the former ancient philologists were not living all their life there, but they produced something very new, very deep. And so, that's the choice. It will be always there. The best would be to be both at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. I'm sorry. Next question. Yeah, Thanks. Um, I'm still a little bit bothered by uh, describing um, using the word religion or religious. So I wonder what's your definition of religion? Because if we define the word in that, anything can become a religion. Sure. Uh, maybe I'm indoctrinated by some view that um, uh, Confucianism wasn't uh, religious because there was, I mean, that, that was the, I think that was a, um, the sort of contemporary understanding that there's no transcendence in, the, uh, in this. So it's, um, so I wonder what, what is your uh, um, understanding of religion? And secondly, in, in, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned one uh, 19th century scholar who actually did say they are Confucian priests. That, that uh, struck me as a bit, uh, you know, uh, that struck me. Uh, I thought that, that wasn't, uh, who, who is a Confucian priest? And you did also mention that most of these uh, scholars who went to China in the uh, 18th century who themselves were very religious people from the Western backgrounds. So religious people see religion. So when they are describing the, uh, the, what they see in China, wouldn't they be you know, transposing or seeing the, the, the Chinese world through their so-called uh, grid of intelligibility, quoting the uh, that they are seeing this kind of, uh, uh, they, they're mapping their, you know, they have their map, uh, their grid to see, to see China. And um, nowadays, in the 20th century, we both these new 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 conclusions or like to and people, people if they people are if people are not arguing it to be uh, if they argue uh, that Confucianism is not religious, that that also part, partly because they are not themselves uh, religious, so they, they are atheists. Mm -hmm. um, it's very garbled, but I just wonder what's your, your thoughts on this. Well, you're completely right that your definition of religion or philosophy would determine whether you can see this religion or not, right? Um, my definition for what it's worth of religion would be that I have it in my paper version, but I did put it in here, I see, is that it is a way of constructing the world, and the world is both, can, it starts inside your body, potentially, certainly Chinese religious culture, a way of defining, describing the world, um, and then excluding the role of the human in defining and describing the world. So the way you legitimate it is 
you describe a world which doesn't need to have a creator god in the Chinese case, uh, yin and yang, blah, 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 but not a creator god, but you describe the world in an X, Y, Z, y, Z way, and you exclude the role of humans in this creative process. You say, it's not created by us, the world is like that. So as, as soon as you exclude the role of humans in creating this world, which in the Chinese case includes loads of divinities, but that's not the essential. As long as you exclude the role of humans, you claim it's given, I would already call it religious. It's a very broad way of defining it. And philosoph philosophy would then allow the role of humans in thinking about it, and science would as well. But science and religion can get very close. Uh, which is why in religious traditions you often have what some people call proto science. But the only thing to me that distinguishes religious culture from the rest is the excluding of the human factor in creating it. In the Chinese case, uh, I would say if you, to my students, I would say if they burn incense, it's religious. But maybe that's circular. Uh, but it would help. It wouldn't work for Japan. Yeah, because in Shintoism we just make noise in order to call the gods, but in, in China actually the burning of incense is a very easy marker. Um, you could say maybe interaction with an uh, extra human force, being, creature, which then would, in both definitions, would make this confusion with these religious practices, which we now, since the 19th century, call confusion religious, according to our criteria. But you're completely right that these 19th century authors did not reflect on what religion or philosophy and so on is. But they never define it. It's very annoying. And they don't define philosophy either. They just use these words as if we all know what it means. So that's true. But I, so I need to have something. Well, I don't need to agree with them. I'm just describing what they say. So I'm still safe. But there is my hidden agenda. Not so hidden, but there is my ultimate agenda. Is that I do think that what people who read the Lu Yu and the Shu Jing, yeah, the book of documents and the book of oaths and the book of changes, what they did is what they used it for was religious. They, first of all, they did burn incense when reading these books very often. Uh, the book of changes was both a description of the cosmos as a whole and a book with which you could catch ghosts, both. Yeah? Uh, so uh, it would be connected by them to understanding how the cosmos functions, even though they wouldn't read the book and then say this is how it functions, but they would have learned uh, through written text, but also through simply attending all kinds of religious activities, they would have learned how the cosmology is, with yin and yang, pa, gua, eight trigrams and so on, and then they would say, and this is all based on the book of changes, which is not true, but that's what the role of the Book of Changes. They would say filial piety, in a uh, basis of ancestor worship and a lot of religious activities, the ghost festival, the seven month funerary ritual, and so on. They would say filial piety is good because it goes back to Confucius. Okay? And so to them, all of, a lot of their religious life would be legitimated by texts that we would, that they associated with Confucius. So I would say, yes, these missionaries had a point. But it's all a matter of what you want it to be. I mean, you can probably define religion and philosophy in such a way that maybe this does not become Christian, or sorry, religion. Uh, there is a whole group of people who want Buddhism to be a philosophy. Right? And they will, and they, you can argue that. But uh, when you go into the field and look at what people actually do with the figure of Buddha and so on, but it's very hard to escape the word religion for it. But there is a group that wants to deny that Buddhism is religion or Taoism. So it's all a matter of the definitions in the end. Sure. Can I add a little bit on that? I, the, in my opinion, maybe I'm, I'm not into you know, uh, the psychology and all these things at all. So I haven't, uh, I'm speaking out of my depth. But it, it seems to Chinese that Confucian is not a religion. Because it is not organized in the sense that um, we see organized religions such as Christianity and Buddhism. Okay. It's more well, that's the general problem of the, the word religion when we apply it to China, because there is no religion in China that's organized in the same way as, as Christianity, anyhow. Which is the whole basis of the idea that in China, I've had 
very very famous Chinese people say to me, China does not have religion. It has mixin, it has superstition and customs and, and so on, but it has no religion. So you can as I said, you can define it the way. If you define it, if you define religion in the old way, like having a holy book and uh, specialists of the holy book, right? And maybe the transcend and so on, you can define it in such a way that in China there's very little religion. That's definitely possible. Uh, and it's convenient because in that way yeah, you can persecute a lot of stuff as not being religious, like Falun Gong. So I call Falun Gong religion, they don't, yeah, they call themselves scientific, but I call them religious. Um, the government says they are not, they are just a dangerous way of thinking. I would call this sectarian religion, yeah, if it's Scientology or all kinds of yeah, new religious groups, I would call them religion. Whereas many states and many other religious people, Christians and so on, would call them just dangerous ways of thinking or uh, psycho terror or whatever, right? I mean, that all gets in the way. So it's a matter of definitions, that makes it very tricky. But according to the Chinese law, um, Confucianism would not be a religion, I suppose. And Christianity would be, but house churches would not be, and so on, right? I mean, because religion, by definition, has to be recognized by the state in mainland China today, so that's another way of looking at it. But definitions is where it starts. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Professor Kahal, it's a very insightful talk. Um, my question is kind of relevant to the previous one, but instead of asking your definition of religion, well, okay, it's, sure. it's, good to, yeah, it's good to know your, your definition anyway, but I, I would like to ask about their, I mean, the Sinologist definition on religion. Now, I mean, the, you mean the, the 19th the, century people. Yeah, I mean, the very definition of, of a religion and philosophy to me. I mean, in China or in Chinese, it's a very kind of modern concepts, aren't they? I mean, of course, there have been elements of religion or philosophy in Chinese history for hundreds of thousands of years, but the Chinese scholars seldom use these kinds of concepts there. So, so my question is that if you have observed a trend, which is that for Western uh, sinologists or scholars, that uh, they first consider it, uh, Confucianism more like a religion, but now I mean the 20th century is more about more like a philosophy. So what's behind the change? Is it because their own kind of definition of religion changed? Because I'm not sure the emerge of modern social science or other kind of things, or the the, the transformation of religions thoughts themselves, or because they are getting uh, more, they're, they're getting to know China better and better, or they have more opportunity to communicate with okay. people in China so that they have changed their mind. That's my kind of first question. So, what's. I'm going to answer question. that first because I'm oh, sure I'll forget the second yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, what I've tried to argue, mm -hmm. I may be wrong, right? But what I've I tried to argue today and uh, spend more time on in the future is that the 19th century mysteries got it better than 20th century people. Better in terms of they, because the 19th century mysteries, for all their limitations, many limit, it's very easy to find their limitations, uh, but so do we today, to find limitations. but they certainly have limitations, one of them being they wanted to spread Christian beliefs. That means you see religion in a certain way, and maybe you see religion in the wrong places, but they saw a complete Chinese culture, some of them, at least, right? And they could see complete, because the way these cults, state cults, cultural Confucius, ancestor cults, lived, functioned in the 19th century was, well, was not necessarily the same as in the past, but it was a continuation of and change of things that had gone on and on and on. It was still there, it was part of a larger whole of temple cults, Buddhist monsters, and so on. Whereas the 20th century people cannot see it anymore because the state god is gone. The cult for Confucius is sometimes revived, but very marginally. And, and very much in a late 20th, early 19th century, early 21st century way. I mean, it has very little bearing on the traditional cult. I, I, so, I'll cut my second question, but I, I will just make a more comment on, on, on what you just answered, which is very interesting. But 
would, wouldn't there be also an alternative, which is the very reason the missionaries ignored that copyright simply because their version of religion is quite simple. That's Christianity. Mm -hmm. Whatever it means is Christianity. Whereas in the 20th century, because there is development of either because of modern social science or because the world is getting smaller, that people's very different definition of religion became more complicated and more, in a way, inclusive. So that's why they are more hesitating when they say that Confucian is or is not a religion. Um, so the second part of the, my, the last part of my lecture, clearly not clear enough, would be, was on explaining, right? Why do they start to see it more as a philosophy? And my claim, again, I may be wrong, but my claim is that these early, very late 19th, early 20th century writers who turned Confucianism into a philosophy actually knew less about living China, not always their fault, but they knew less, which is not to say they have no contributions. Uh, the late 19th, early 20th century Sinologists, especially in France, more than Germany, especially in France, have made lasting contributions, whereas the late, the early 20th century German students of China usually are forgotten. Except for Wilhelm, most of you won't know people like Conradi and so on. I mean, most of them are forgotten, but so the French are not. But both the French and the Chinese, and in fact, this one Dutch guy, Eifender, who was very influential in the 1930s, all of them had a very textual, text-based, which is not to say it's wrong, but it's, lim it's limited in another way. It was text-based, and they were part of a tradition in Europe, which I've briefly referred to as academic, a more academic way of scholarship. Yeah, and I, I threw out the word footnotes, bibliography, I mean, different way of doing scholarship from before, in which there was a natural tendency to look at foundational text. That I did not say yet. Foundational texts. So, Islam, that's our modern word. At the time, it was called Mohammedanism, Mohammedism, right? So the founder, like Confucianism, Christianity, Buddhism. Um, but Islam was based on the Quran. It's a mistake many people make, even Islamic people make today. I mean, clearly, Islam is not based solely on the Quran, but on a whole body of not just Hadith, but, but yeah, later traditions in which determine how we see the Quran. And in the same way. Uh, the learning was never read pure, that's a very late 20th century development, but it was always read through a lens. And I would argue it was always part of a living practice in which you burnt incense, in which you worshipped Confucius, in which you did other things that you associated with him. But the idea that, the learning, that Confucianism is reducible to a single text, or a small group of texts, but not the five classics, because it was quite clear by then, that the five classics had not been written or transmitted by Confucius, except maybe the spring and autumn annals, but that's, if you've ever read it, it's more boring than boring. I mean, it's, there is no, you can't deduce philosophy out of it, you can do it with a commentary, but not from the original. I mean, it's very contrived. And so you had to go, if you think in terms of the foundational text, you had to go to the Renew, because the Renew was believed to go back to initially be by Confucius. I think early on in the 20th century, both uh, the Bush again, so the people who doubted, I think at the end, people like Duyfendak and, and so on, they realized that it was not by Confucius himself, but, but then by his pupils, and so on. Right? So that was the foundational text. And the Tao Te Ching, the Book of the Way in the Virtue, was the foundational text of Taoism. And so we, we, and this is 20th century development, that you think of these traditions in terms of the first text and you forget about the lens through which, you, through which these, texts, these texts have always been written. Nowadays, but this is really, for instance, my view of the Renew. That's, we are talking about the view of the last 10, 20 years, very recent. We are realizing that none of these texts was ever read without a commentary until the 20th century. That these texts came into being as the result of oral traditions, in which these, there were many texts, texts, but they were not read as texts, they were read with the way of reading. And the oldest commentary we have on the Tao Te Ching, Book of the Way of Virtue, is transmitted, by the way, in a legalist text. Yeah, but that shows that this is really very old text. But from the beginning, 
it's transmitted with chemistry. So this, yeah, this is essential. So if we want to understand early Chinese philosophy, that's possible. First of all, yeah, it's fine to ignore the religious bits that are there. I have no problems with that as such. But then to claim that this is the experience of people at the time would be a problem, because people at the time would worship. Right? And to claim that we are discovering the original meaning, maybe it's possible, but uh, then the Lunyu is not a very good text to do, because we can now demonstrate that parts of the Lunyu were made up, yeah, made into the Lunyu in the 2nd and 1st century BC. And not by Confucius, but we're just around, floating around. I haven't made that up, I mean, I'm just borrowing bits and pieces from other people, students, in fact. My students, very lucky in that. So, so this text simply hasn't been read in, as an original. It's always read. It. So, in order, so uh, to me, it's much more interesting to look at, for instance, Confucian history in terms of this context in which these texts were used. Maybe not even read, but used. And this context consists of worship and things we now nowadays, since the late 19th century only, call religious. And it's, Tradition was not an issue, it was completely normal to do. It's only to us, because we have the possibility of not being religious, that it becomes something special. In the past, it was totally normal, nobody thought about it, in China or in the rest. But, so if we want to understand the lived experience of dealing with all these old texts, I think we need to get this religious dimension back. And in that respect, the mystery is so more than we. And that's not to say that it's all wrong, yeah, what these 20th century people did, but we are now at a stage that we can make the experience that Chinese people had in using the text like of the Lunyu and so on and so forth more complete. And the way they would use the book of the, the, the analects, but also the book of odes, the book of documents, Shu Jing, the book of changes, was in a religious, was in a context of worship. Don't call it religious. Put the concept of context of worship, of sacrifice, of once incense came to China with the Buddhists of burning incense, right? Of on, on the same level that you would do the, the the Bible. You can use the Bible as a source of philosophy, right? It's perfectly possible, but that's not how it was lived until recently. So that's why I think the mysteries they were wrong in many ways, but they did have some things right, and we can learn from that. <laughs> so, what was it? You were right. No? Uh, I, I, I think more than a quick one. Uh, it's all about terminology, actually. And um, the way I used to think about terms is we usually not use them to distinguish things from the others. So we call A team table and what not and confuse it with a chair. So, what. Which doesn't always work. Yeah. Well, but it, it really depends on how good your technology is for a particular kind of application. Speaking of the 19th century, um, scholars who first used the term Confucianism, I just wonder what their system of oppositions was. So, was it called Confucianism in order to distinguish it from Taoism and Buddhism, as we often do today, like we, we think in terms of Sanjia? And basically, it is something that apparently we sort of borrowed from the Chinese. To, at least it is a Western reflection on the on each hand's system of oppositions. Or did they think in a different kind of perspective? And if so, what was it? Mm -hmm. Well, they did not oppose Greek philosophy, I think. Uh, but then I don't seriously know enough about the word philosophy in the 19th century or before. But I don't think it was second. But that was not their opposition. Their opposition was good and bad. So. What they called Confucianism was good, Buddhism was tolerable, and Taoism was bad. That was more or less. And so Confucian was in Taoism, and then whatever was. And then some of them have local cults or popular, or, and they have words of that type. But usually Taoists get off very badly because this is. Most of them are doing their work in the 1850s and onwards. And you see here the difference. Do little, just do little is the Fujian. Fujian is barely hit by the typing tempo, by the big rebellions. I'm not saying it's peaceful, but it's relatively okay. And he has a very relaxed view of Taoism. To him, Taoism is, is a positive thing. 
because he sees those priests that function yeah, in providing funerary services, exorcisms, cosmic renewal, and so on. So he's not terribly negative. The God is not terribly negative either, if, if not positive. Um, but the people who are in the Lower Yangtze region, or Norfolk, they are much more critical of Taoism, but because the Taoism, whatever it is, the Taoist priests, the heavenly masters, and so on, that they see, are literally under siege. Because the rebellion of the Taiping King, which is in its inspiration in part Christian, destroys Confucianism, of course, and it destroys Confucian temples, and it destroys Taoists, right? the heavenly masters, and Buddhists, but, but this, which also Taoists a lot. And so the Taoist heavenly masters fled to Shanghai, and he's a refugee. It's not exactly a state of being in which you elicit well, sympathy perhaps, but sympathy for, for refugees in the 19th century is non-existent. I mean, actually, Western colonial officers disapprove of sympathy for refugees until the late 19th century, also in China, very interesting. So it's not something that yeah, for them was positive. The Taoism that they saw, they thought, saw, was all in decline, in economic decline. And so they had a very negative view of it, where there were still Buddhist monasteries and practices that were sort of intact that they could see. And they could, there is a whole textual corpus that is very accessible because it was reprinted a lot, also in the Qing period. The Taoist corpus of text is not reprinted a lot, it's very much manuscript culture. So unless you know the priests, you wouldn't have the texts. And there have been texts printed, but they were not accessible, they were hidden away in a few monasteries. So it was much easier to get to know Buddhism. So Buddhism is okay, it is a great adversary, almost. Right? It's an adversary they take very seriously. And Confucianism, since it's of the elite, and in the end, although not the highest elite, the people that these priests meet are, well, the local school teachers, who want to be Confucians, if you want, and want to be Lithuanians. And so, I would say the opposition is good and bad. An enemy that you can sympathize with, Confucians, or, or at least take serious Buddhism, and then those, the Taoists. Would that work? Yeah, that, yes, that, that, uh, that yeah. would mean that they did uh, subscribe to the uh, notion of Saint Yao. Yes. Mm. Yes. I think with your talk, uh, I mean, I, my question is: It seems that you, you correct me if I'm wrong. You, you blame the problem, which you think is the problem, the narrow interpretation of what Confucianism is, based on the lack of first-person experience, namely the built work. But I wonder whether the picture is more complicated than, than just well, the field work, lack of field lack experience. Of, yeah. Because these 19th century people didn't do field work. So lack of field experience plus they focus on foundational texts. Yeah. So two things. And the focus on foundational texts fitted very well with their classical upbringing. So late 19th, 20th century university researchers would have learned Latin and Greek, perhaps even Hebrew, in high school. Yeah, that's certainly in Holland or in Germany, in France, I think, as well. England, I don't know, possibly. Uh, but these early ones, von Davi and uh, von der Gabelens and so on, the very early sinologists in Germany were classicists. They were specialists of Latin and Greek. So they defined uh, the origins of Greek culture in terms, which actually, well, that's another story, but they defined it in terms of Plato. Right? or Aristotle, and so on, or the Bible. So any tradition that you study in the present has to be traced back to its written origins. And that's where the limitation comes into being. It is a bit, and they wouldn't do that for Christianity because that was their own religion anyhow. Right? So even though when they studied Christianity, they would go back yeah, to, they were Protestants mostly, back to the Bible, but in reality they would see this Bible through centuries of accretion of for the interpretation. I have a following question. I don't know whether it's really uh, irrele relevant to your project, but you seem to ascri ascribe Confucianism to the later usage of Ru Jiao. However, the definition, the differentiation of Ru Jiao and Ru Xue in our modern usage is pretty clear in a sense we have a very broad sense of what religion and what philosophy is. However, this shift of usage of Ru Jiao and Ru Xue 
probably was much clearer than the shift of Confucianism. And I wonder how the times probably correlated to each other because when we think of the 19th century philosophy, philosophical Confucianism, it still differs from what we think of the new, modern new Confucianism, which is established in Hong Kong, from Hong Kong. Well, yeah. Perfect. yeah. So I wonder, I, I'm not sure whether this. I'm not talking about Xin Lu Xue, so new, new, new Confucianism. I know very little about it, or really nothing, except that it exists. And, um, and that's up to them, right? I mean, I, I don't intend to study it, I have to stop somewhere. Um, I'm fully aware that, so Lu Xue would be a modern term, anyhow. Right? At least I've never encountered it in the past. Tao Xue, the study of the Tao, yes, but not Lu Xue. Lu Tiao is very common. I can easily go back to the Sun, I'm pretty sure it's older. Ru obviously is even older. But these words, I think I mentioned that not just to cover myself, part. Also, you always want to cover yourself. But I think we need research into the semantic, in the history of the semantics of these terms. So Ru will probably mean different things in different periods. Mm -hmm. And not just in the ancient period and after, but quite possible yeah, throughout Chinese imperial history. There's one article, Robert Campany. History of Religious 2003, he actually studies the words that are used for stuff that we would call religious of Hua, Ta, Ru, in the 5th, 6th, 7th century. And he shows that actually they did have a concept of religion for which they used the word Ta. And they had a concept of Buddhism. It may not overlap completely with ours and, and so on, but they had a concept. That's the main thing. And whereas until the Han, I think they did not. So the origin of these the origin, and of probably if until the hunter did not have a need for a concept because there was no flaw, no Buddhism, right? So until the advent of Buddhism, whatever it is, that there was no need to have concepts for religion because it was just whatever. Uh, but, but that would require research. I haven't done it. I might want to, but, but I haven't done it. So that, but you're right that it's extremely necessary to do it. Uh, one thing that I would throw out which came to me over last week when increasingly aware of the fact that I had to actually present what I had written here orally, yeah, it's much more difficult orally, um, is that it may be that the 19th century missionaries and the early 20th century, let's say, academic sinologists, encountered a very specific Confucian, let's call it Confucian tradition, Wu Tiao, that is the product of late Ming and especially Qing developments. So that what they saw and what they called religion, in which a lot of stuff was uh, traced back to the five classics, that that actually is a new form of Ru, but it's not necessarily the Sum one or the Tang one, right? Or the previous one. Because I think in, if that part of what they saw as this, these practices that are based supposedly on the five classics was the invention of the early Qing uh, yeah, Confucians, like uh, Li Gu and, uh, and others. So that's quite possible, but that would make my paper even longer and more complicated because it would require serious work on my part. Until now it was very easy because I just need to read English, <laughs> some French and some German. Of course, when you have to start to read Chinese sources and no research has been done, it does take more time. Which is not to say it shouldn't or couldn't be done, but, but I think that the phenomenon they saw may be a specific late imperial phenomenon, and I suspect that the, the rule of the majority of the Tumati in the Yuan Dynasty or early Ming or Sum would be more limited. Maybe, if you wish, more philosophical, modern term, retrospectively applied. Because to them, Sum, Yuan, Ming, early Ming people, combining these texts with Buddhist texts and Taoist texts was more normal. So the reason, and I'm speculating, I'm just throwing it up. The reason that Confucianism, that the 19th century people identified as such, is more religious, is the result of it becoming more religious in order to push Buddhist Taoist practices out. In the only way, and I think even Neo-Confucianism might be more religious, having a cosmology, a meta level, because it wants to push Buddhism out of, not of Confucians, but out of their life. Therefore, they have to make the Confucian text more religious. Mm -hmm. 
Right? So there might be a history there. But that's a topic in itself that I would need to study. And it's quite possible that the study of books of Ode and so on, that's in the Han or in the Tang, was much more, if you wish, secular because these people were Buddhists. Right? I mean, most Han literati just were Buddhists or Buddhists and Taoists. I mean, they practiced stuff that we would call Buddhists and Taoists. And as part of their life, they also read the Book of Odes and the Book of Do uh, Documents and so on and so forth. But they didn't use it to get religious inspiration. They only did that once they wanted to push the Buddhist up. And that I do think, but I haven't proven it. I would have to say. Yeah, I just have a question. Actually, in response to that, I think the modern, actually, um, the revival, so-called revival, uh, or, or emphasis of the religious aspect of the Confucianism, or that, um, that is also probably in response to the development of Christianity in China, because they do actually that China needs to have some kind of yeah. religious system, the indigenous, uh, indigenous religious well, system. Indigenous and not that always <laughs> um, sure. so, yeah, the question I have is that the, in your research, you need to look at. And by the way, the people who do that from okay. the late 19th century onwards, Kanye Wei, uh -huh. are people who know about Christianity. I mean, Kanye Wei knows, yeah, he's from near Canton. He knows that Christianity is around and that you have to deal with it. So mm -hmm. that would be certain too. Um, yeah, I, uh, my question is that in your research, you look at primarily actually the, the 19th century uh, Western scholars and their. Um, Observations or understanding of um, uh, uh, Chinese of uh, this Confucian actually uh, system, and whether actually the how the Chinese scholars themselves review actually these um, the composition of a you know the Wuja or Wu Xue, um, I think would be very interesting. Whether that there is some certain some kind of evolution going on, whether the Chinese scholars themselves actually were aware of them, whether, whether this can be reflecting their writing. I think. You mean aware of? Where are these kind of religious so-called um, okay. dimension? Yeah, the dimension. problem is, of course, this was pointed out. The word religion, <coughs> yeah. Zhongjia, Japanese word, mm. introduced, I think, late 19th century to China. I mean, that's the concept of a religion as a separate thing. Mm. It's a very new concept. So, by almost by definition, before that, you can't have that right. notion, right? It would have to be ritual. That's what. And what we do know, there is quite a body of research on that now that there is a revival or. They would say revival, uh, we would say, well, the reinvention of traditions, so actually something completely new, from the 6th, 17th century onwards, in China, but also in Japan, of seeing these Confucian texts in terms of ritual practices, not religion because they don't have to work. And that does happen, that's what I just mentioned in my reply, that, that, that is there, mm -hmm. definitely. And they, I'm not sure, they will probably, if they had had the word religion, they might have not liked it because it would have connected it too much with mm -hmm. despicable local popular stuff. Because that's part of it too. If religion is backward, then you don't want to call whatever you do religion. Mm -hmm. That's why this Falun Gong calls itself scientific. Or Christian science. Yeah, well, it's not just the Falun Gong, it's a very common approach of new religious movements to call themselves scientific. Scientology being a case in point. Obviously religion. But they call themselves science. Maybe science is a good yeah, but so, And the fact that, China, that Christianity appears functions in the same way as when Buddhism appeared, it forces Chinese culture to define itself. It's also the word Tungo, China, is very common in Buddhist discourse, much more common than in China. Tungo as China, not as uh, the Huanghe and Zhongmen countries, but Tungo in the sense that we would call yeah, China. That's our word. That, that appears in the Buddhist context because people who are Chinese Buddhists have now to talk about their culture, Wu, Wu Tiao, or our culture, our teachings, and them. And so we are Jungo, and they are. So Jungo is not used as a word by politicians, but always in cultural terms. And Christianity is another challenge. And that means that you have, and that's what comes your way, so you try to redefine Wu Tiao as Wu Tiao. And what I don't know, but there are people studying it, so I can ask them and simply copy what they write is to what extent that's influenced by the challenge of the Did I answer your question? Yeah. Um, I just want to hear uh, your questions. Yeah.
could I ask you a question in Chinese? Hey, for sure, sure. My English is bad. So, my question is, uh, <laughs> Please answer it in Chinese. <laughs> 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 哲学当然是好的东西，但是宗教就不是好的东西，所以你不要以比较尊重的东西叫做宗教，可以叫做意识。因为意识不见得是宗教性，那有社会上的意识，我们这里面有意识，比方说有一个儒释方，所以意识不
thought of neo new Confucianism. And I said, it's fine. I mean, I couldn't do it because I'm of a suspicious nature. I always distrust reinvention of tradition and so on. But I recognize that this is a valuable enterprise that goes on in every culture. And that I would say, but now in English, we are always the product of reinventing our own culture for the time. Anyway. Um, are there further questions that you have um, for Professor Pantera? Well, if there are no further questions, let's uh, um, um, thank the Professor Pantera again for this. <laughs>